Our opening hymn is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, found on page uh, 686 in your blue hymnals. the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. You shall not make for yourself any idol. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Kneeling if able and using the form on page 352, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. I now invite the youth to go down to Children's Chapel with Miss Jane. be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. The thoughts and habits that we let form our hearts and minds make a real difference in our health, our families, all our relationships, with God and with others. Gazing upon Jesus on the cross sets our minds and hearts aright. A reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person will look upon the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 107, please read responsibly by whole verse. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Let the the redeemed redeemed of the Lord Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble. And gather in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some Some were were sick through through their their sinful ways, and because because of their their iniquities endured endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they they cried cried to the Lord in their their trouble, and he he saved saved them from from their distress. distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let Let them them thank thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell the deeds with songs of joy. The work and way of Jesus is the opposite of what the world would tell us to do. God has a different plan, one for our good. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, 
the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with us, with him, and seated us, with him in the heavenly places in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Not that the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning all for eyes to see you clearly, ears to hear you truly, and hearts to understand you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. This one I'm afraid I'm going to knock off, but we'll, we'll see. One of the challenges of life in a pandemic, right? So um, I was tempted. I shared with 8 o'clock kind of as a passing con- uh, this discussion this morning, and I threw one of these one-offs. If you'll recall a couple weeks ago, um, we were talking about how it's Jesus. I thought I was just kind of reminding us of the foundations of our faith, that we're saved because of Jesus' faith, not our own. And I know, thanks to a number of conversations and discussions and emails and texts, that, that uh, for some people that was actually a new teaching, and I probably should have fleshed it out even more for everybody. But you can see the impact of that here in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, right? That it's, that it's a free gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. If your faith doesn't save you, you can't claim to have better faith than somebody else. Only one person's faith mattered. That was Jesus's. So you can see how Paul's theology is based on that. And you don't have to listen to that nonsense that Pauline Christianity is different from Jesus Christianity is different from anything else that's going on. I was, um, and I was tempted, of course, to do John's Gospel because it's got 316. And like most people, I've been watching Championship Week on ESPN and all the basketball games. And Somehow, even without people in the stands, they still got some people that are standing there with John 3.16 signs. So, you know, that, that's always fun this time of year when that comes up. But I was really drawn to numbers, and mostly as an antidote or a vaccination against what some of your friends might hear. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit what's going on and why it's happening. And I will say, initially, I was trying to figure out how to work in that great movie. If you're a big movie buff, and especially bad movies, like if you're rocking children when they're babies because your wife's getting some sleep. And so you watch those terrible movies that are sometimes on late at night. There's a movie called Snakes on a Plane. I hear some, well, I see, I hope nobody wasted money at the theaters to go see that one. It wasn't exactly a, a great, I'm all about the suspension of disbelief, but come on, you know. But it stars Samuel L. Jackson, and Samuel L. Jackson's got a particular tagline. I've got a friend who uh, is in that business now, and, and he hangs out with Sam in, um, in Vegas every now and again. And he says, you would not believe the number of people they'll ask him to say his tagline. And for those of you who know what his tagline is, it begins with M, it's got an F in the middle, and it ends in an S. Okay, I see some nods and some laughing. If you don't, good for you. That means you're not, you're not tempting yourself into sin. But people will walk up to Sam all the time and say, dude, will you say, and of course Sam will be eating a steak, or he'll be drinking a beer, or he'll be doing it, and he'll say it right off the bat, you know, about them interrupting, and they don't catch it. He's already done it for them, and they've missed it. And then he's like, you're stupid too. And so Sam's, a, Sam's a, an interesting chap. But thanks to some colleagues, I was called more towards uh, C.S. Lewis today, and particularly The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. For those of you who've read the book and seen the movie, we're reminded, particularly in that book and at the end, when Lucy is talking about Aslan. And she reminds us that he's a good lion, but he's not a tame lion. The discussion that has been going on in in a couple of my uh, preacher groups this week has been, this is a horrible story to be included in the lectionary. And chiefly it revolves around the fact that God sends serpents to judge his people, apparently, although it doesn't say that explicitly in the text, because a loving, saving, redeeming God would never do such a horrible thing. And that it serves as this ridiculous basis, this ham-fisted, as one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, shoot, commentaries described, a ham-fisted effort to try and tie Jesus to this event. And so there's this entire lack of what's going on. There's an entire uh, misunderstanding, I guess, about salvation history and what's being portrayed. So I decided I'd vaccinate you all against that a little bit today. And if you find yourself in conversations this week with other folks, at least you'll know what you're talking about. So our story picks up near the end of the second generation's trek through the wilderness. Just to kind of recount everything that's happened, you know, all of the enslavement in Egypt and the being freed, the ten plagues, the passing through the Red Sea. They've come to the, to the Jordan and gotten ready to pass into the promised land. And the first generation, rather than choosing to go ahead and enter in, chickens out. The people are too big, they're too strong, there's no way we can win. 
And of course, God is angry and says, haven't you, you know, haven't you noticed what I've done for you thus far? And you're really afraid of this. And because of the, his anger towards them, he says, none of you will enter into the promised land. You'll wander in the wilderness. He's going to let them die off. And so they have been wandering in the wilderness. And the older generation has been dying off. And they've worked their way back. And the best way I could explain it right now, pretend like I came in here today and told you all the Holy Land was uh, Antioch. That that's our promised land. God was going to give us that inheritance. And we were walking down uh, Old Hickory. And somewhere between here and there, an army was waiting for us. And God said, no, I don't want you to fight him right now. We'll wait a later to execute judgment. So I need you all to take a little bit of a more circuitous route to the promised land. And maybe I led you down 65, I took you west on 840, I took you through Hendersonville, Goodlitzville, down the east side through Lebanon, and down 24 to get to the promised land. How disappointed would you be to be that close and have to take that route? That's what's going on here. God's making them take a more circuitous route because he's not executing judgment yet against a people. And so as they begin to walk and, and they begin to see it, and they're actually going the opposite direction that they need to be going in during a part of this, they get really grumbly. And we understand that. And they start complaining about God. We don't have any food. We don't have any drink. You make us eat this what is it. That's the name for manna, by the way, in Hebrew. That's what it means is what is it. You're making us eat this what is it. We're walking, that's all we do. That's all we've been doing since I've been born. And you're making us do this. And, and really, we can understand it. If the promised land was just three or four miles that way and you're having to walk towards Jackson, you're not going to be real happy about it. And so they begin to, to doubt God. They begin to curse God. They begin to, of course, fuss at Moses. And God, understandably and rightfully, is angered. And he sends the snakes. Now, I will confess, and you all can read it here, it's a pretty good translation, there is no, and God sent the snakes among them to punish them. There is not that sentence there. But it's pretty obvious from the context that that's what's going on, and it's made abundantly clear by Israel's response that that's what they understand the snakes to be. Well, what's a fiery snake? I have no idea. Could it be a bright red snake? Sure. I would think that wouldn't be as frightening as, say, uh, one that was really poisonous, though, where it burned you when it bit you, because a bright red snake would stand out in a wilderness setting. It'd be easy to see against the browns and the grays and even the greens where there was some vegetation. It makes more sense to me that it's a poison that when it gets into you, it burns and it hurts. But I don't know. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is God has sent the snakes into the camp. And they've begun to bite the Israelites. Now, one of the ways that people try to soften this is to say, well, there's probably a few people that are left alive from the first generation that chickened out. God would never punish his people. I'll remind you, this is the same God who will exile his people in a few generations. God often punishes his people to remind his people and the rest of the world how seriously he takes living in communion with him I often tell people when they come in and they tell us, oh, America's God's country. You don't want to be God's country. Because if you're not doing the things that God demands of his people, what happens? You get judged. And you don't like judgment. Or let's say his people don't like judgment. So the snakes come into the camp and they start biting people and people start dying. And eventually the people figure it out. Uh-oh, we sinned against God. And so what do they do? And this is one of the big differences between the first generation of Israel and the second generation of Israel. They recognize they've sinned against God and they've sinned against Moses, and they go to Moses, who's the intercessor, he's the prophet, he's the leader of God's people, and says, we've sinned against you and God. Would you please intercede on our behalf? I have to think that was a wonderful experience for Moses. If you go back and you read the Exodus story and you read the beginning of Numbers, Moses puts up with a lot of nonsense. 
he's always a fun place to go. Sometimes as a rector, you got to listen to people gripe and complain and harp on every little thing that you do, and you feel bad. And then you get to the readings where you get to Moses again, and you're like, eh, it could be worse. I could have Israel. They apologize, they repent to Moses, and they ask him to intercede to God, and he does. And God tells Moses, I want you to make a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and stick it in the middle of the camp. And tell people, when they get bit, look to the snake. We're told, of course, Moses does as he's told. And what happens? Those that look to the snake are healed, and those who don't continue to die. In an easy sense, and as you've already heard from the gospel reading today from John, it's one of those prefigures of the cross. It sounds really stupid and foolish to us, particularly those of you all who are in the medical community here among us, that the cure for a big bad snake bite is going to be, hey, look at that, that bronze snake in the middle of the camp. Most of us, you know, grew, I grew up watching westerns, and they always, when people would get bit by snakes, would cut the X and then suck it out. And of course, medical people here, I see y'all, you're going, oh, yeah, don't, yeah, I know, it's the movies. We don't believe what goes on in the movies, right? Willful suspension of disbelief. But that seems smarter than just looking at a bronze snake in the middle of us and expecting to be healed. At least I'm doing something, at least I'm getting rid of the poison, maybe if I can suck hard enough and fast enough. And it didn't get into the bloodstream. But that's the cure. It's foolish much like the cross. A couple things are going on here I want you to pay attention to, and then there's a couple things for how we uh, see it in, in, in modern times, why it's important for us to focus a little bit on this lesson in this season that we call Lent. The first thing to understand is that the snake was a created thing in the beginning. And when God created the heavens and the earth, what did he say about everything he created? It was good. You and I understand that material, that flesh, that all this stuff, the way it was created when God did it, it was good. It's part of our countercultural testimony against those people who say ideas and, and brains and all that stuff is what's important. In the ancient Near East, the idea that a God would want to become human was just an anathema. Why would a God get into our flesh? We suffer, we get sick, we experience all kinds of privations. Who wants that? It's better to be in the celestial world. It's better to be in the heavens and not suffer that stuff. And if you need to come down for a little bit, use the ziggurat over there, get your food on the way down, and then come among us, but then get back up before you start to experience the bad things. And yet the Christian narrative has always reminded us that the world, the things that are around us were intended for good. That it was blessed by God. And this becomes important for those of us who claim to be Christians because what's the world going to look like? One of those Christian myths that's out there, and I sat through a lot of these sermons when I was a kid, is that when I died, I'd go to heaven, I'd sit on a, a cloud with wings and play a harp. <sighs> we're going to have bodies, brothers and sisters, and we're going to live in a world most likely. A world that's not tainted by sin. Where things function the way that they were supposed to before we went out and took and destroyed and didn't steward. And the beginning of all that impact, of course, goes back to the Garden of Eden when the serpent becomes the means for Satan to trick Eve and Adam. And so here's God reminding us in this story of his power to redeem all things. Even the snake. You say, well, how do I know he's redeeming him, Brian? Well, what's the snake made of that's put on the, rock, on the pole? Bronze. Bronze was the purified metal in the ancient Near East. You smelted it together to separate the impurities and to put the metals together to make the armor or to make the sword that was light enough to be carried into battle but strong enough to protect or to do the job that it had been given to do. We understand this in our history, the refiner's fire. 
I said earlier today, I said, you all remember that song, maybe some of you all do, singing that song 20, 30 years ago, Refiner's Fire, and somebody said, I think that's 50 or 60 years old, Father. And I, okay, however old it is. But we understand that, even in, even in our culture, as we don't realize where it comes from. Go back through the Old Testament and read about the refining fire. That God, when he's in our midst, is a refining fire. He cleanses away our impurities and restores us to the way that he intended us to be before he created us. It's beautiful. And, as the author of John notices, of course, he's lifted up, prefiguring what goes on with Christ, that even something that had been used and was understood to be a source of evil for humanity can be used by God for his redemptive purposes. Hopefully you can see the ties between the cross and that, and that one. And we did have a couple fun conversations, and I'll just say it for those who are interested in the history. Well, isn't that building an idol? Well, no. Moses builds it because God instructs him. And it's for a specific purpose. When the fiery snakes bite you, look at it, and you'll be healed. Now, to show you how far people stray from God, by the time King Hezekiah is king, he gets complimented in the histories in the Bible for destroying the bronze serpent. The people of Israel recognize that it was a sign of grace in their midst, and they keep it. And it's put out into the temple, and it becomes much like our shrines in, in Christian churches today, where we go worship the saint because of a pinky bone or a shoulder blade or whatever other nonsense. And it distracts from the worship of God, and Hezekiah understands it and destroys it. So yes, human beings, again, despite all this deliverance, turn from the one who delivers, goes their own way, and sins. Well, what are the big lessons? There's two big lessons I want you to pay attention and take this week as, as you're looking at this. And the first, of course, is in the context of the book of Numbers, and I've already touched a little bit on it. The book of Numbers is so named because that's where all the numbers are. One of my favorite commentaries that I ever read, and this was back in seminary when I had to do a sermon on it in class there, Call said the book of Numbers was like his dad's desk, where dad kept all the bills for doing the taxes and all the numbers. And so Moses had all this information, and he had to do something with it because he felt bad about wanting to get rid of it because God had given it to him. And so he just put it all into this little book that we call the book of Numbers. It's kind of funny when you think about it. I grew up with a mom who kept everything on a secretary in the living room that we weren't allowed to touch. It had all the receipts. It had all the, the numbers that were important to her, and you didn't touch anything on it. So I understand it at that level. But there's a much more important reason that the book of Numbers exists. There's a much more important reason, I think, why God caused it to be written, why God caused it to be edited, and why God caused it to be collected and enshrined in the canon. And that is, of course, the reminder that we each have a choice, each generation. You and I are the product of our families. Each of us has been raised in a particularly you know, unique family system. They're unique in that they're all different, but they're all similar in that they're all dysfunctional. I like to joke that mine put the fun in dysfunction. Most of the time it did. There are times where it didn't, and you can't laugh at it. But we're all products of where we grew up. And the great testimony of Numbers is that God holds each generation accountable for its own choices. The first generation refuses to trust him, and more importantly, refuses to repent when Moses gives them the instructions that they're not going to enter into the promised land. They're so enslaved to their fleshiness, they are so enslaved to the way they think the world operates that they're unwilling to accept the grace of God and trust him to save them. And so they're condemned to spend the rest of their lives wandering in the wilderness. Now the second generation has been raised in that. They've heard the griping. Can you imagine? Think about all the horror stories that your grandmother and your grandfather told you. Have you ever had to sit and listen about their bunion or one of those nasty things that sometimes old people get stuck on? 
Imagine having to listen to him complain about having to walk for the last 20 years or the last however long. Can you imagine how old that would get? And can you imagine some of the family systems that would have developed? And yet here we are just mere miles from the promised land. The second generation commits the same sin. Oh, God, you don't know what you're doing. You're leading me away from the promised land. You're making me eat this. What is it? You don't give me food. You don't give me drink. Great, 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 great. Complain, complain, complain. And when the punishment comes among you, what happens? Ooh. God's getting my attention. I better repent. And unlike their forebears who refuse to impent, repent, the second generation repents and gets to inherit the land after a nice long speech from Moses. They're given that choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. And they choose to serve the Lord. And Moses reminds them, if you don't serve the Lord, he will punish you. If you refuse to listen to the punishments and repent, he will cause the land to disgorge you. Words that the prophets will use later when they find themselves exiled among the nations. The other reason that I want us to pay attention to that story, though, is because of what it means to us personally. Each of us here gathered is responsible for our own choice. You may have been raised in the worst family system that no psychiatrist has discovered yet. You may have been raised in the best one. Maybe you were raised by super devout, super heroes of our faith. And you're hoping, well, I'll ride their coattails into heaven. Each of us gathered here has a little bit of a unique story in our formation. But each of us is responsible for our own choice today. Whom do we serve? And each day that you and I awake, each day that the Lord sends us out into the wilderness to be his representatives, to be his ambassadors, to be his sons and daughters that he's given this wonderful message, we have to decide whom will we serve? Will I serve my own desires? Will I soon serve my own whatever? Which invariably leads to death. Or will I do those things that God has asked me to do? Will I even maybe go in the opposite way that, that I think I should be going to get to where I think I want to be? And trust that my deliverer, who promised me on Calvary, and in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, that at the end of this little journey, I will be with him for all eternity, and that I'll share in his glory. Part of our season of Lent, brothers and sisters, is to remind us of those things which cause us to wander off away from God, those things which, if we followed to the ends and to our own devices and to the love of our own fleshy hearts, would lead to death, eternal death. And to remind ourselves here in the middle, each day that we're alive, we're given the grace by God to repent. That that cross stands in the middle of our camp. And if we remind ourselves and look to it, we'll live. Standing and turning to page 358, let us confess our faith as found in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds in the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are form five found on page 389 of the Book of Common Prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the holy church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, John, our bishop, Brian, our priest, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel into the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that the spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president and members of Congress, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live and work in this community, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor, for the right to use the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the prosecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, Elizabeth Costa, Jack Dreyer, Elizabeth Gilliam, Betsy Gregory, Patsy Gross, Bob Hollister, Cornelia Hollister, John Johnson, Joyce Johnson, Jerry and Maurice, Maurice Keithley, Bobby Krieger, Andy Martin, Jane Moss, Jill McComas, excuse me, Liz McComas, Pauline McIntyre, Landy Norris, Andrea Parsons, Jim Rosalino, Jane Simmons, Jean Ann Tarleton, Mark, Michael Woods, Ann Williams for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We commend to you, to your gracious care and keeping, all the men and women of the armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in the trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, our families and friends and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Iglesia Anglicana de Chile, especially the most reverend Hector Zavala, primate of the Anglican Church of Chile and the diocesan bishop of Santiago. And locally, we pray for St. Andrew's Church, New Johnsonville, especially the reverend David Yancey. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayer for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, restore the penitent, impart a passion for accomplishment of your will and purpose, grant to our parish all things necessary for our common life and inspire 
us to pray and labor diligently for the extension of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, the Father of all, whose Son commanded us to love our enemies, lead them and us from all prejudices into truth, deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, revenge, and in your good time, enable us to all stand reconciled before you. We pray this week for the Episcopal Church women. O God, who in their time has called Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah, Elizabeth, Martha, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, to serve you with gladness, bless, we pray you, the Episcopal Church women of this parish and the purposes of this group whom you have caused to be assembled in your name. Give them charity with one another, generosity in their good works, and devotion to the spread of your kingdom. We ask your blessings on all missionaries and their families, especially the Harvey family, the John family, the Pine family, and the Zentner family. For all who have died in the communion of your church, for those whose faith is known to you alone, with all the saints, they may, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another to, and all our life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord, our God. For yours is the majesty, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I know it's a little bit of a, a dreary day, and to make matters worse, it's that worst night of the year where we set our clocks forward. Um, I know some people are excited to have a little more daylight, but I hate that hour of sleep that I lose on this day. I'm a much more big fan of the fallback. Um, I'm also a fan of those, let's just pick a time and stick with it. I could, I could live with that. Um, yeah. Um, so normal week going on this week, at least for, for this week. Um, tomorrow morning, we've got Psalms Bible study at uh, 1030. Tuesday evening is Rock Hound, so there's no Luke uh, Bible study. Wednesday, we've got the Saint of the Day and Stations of the Cross. And then um, I think that's it. Do we have pickup this week? Oh, Thursday is food delivery. So if you're looking for a little exercise, you've got a strong back, um, join us as we'll be receiving food about 11, 11, 15 here at the church to continue to, to feed people in our community in need. Um, I do want to give a couple of quick updates. We got a couple of praise reports. Uh, Byram, who was our plumber, and I don't know if you all remember, the in intercessors do. He uh, spent some time in the hospital. They discovered... While well, he was having these other problems, he had a great big mass. I think it was on his, it was either his liver or pancreas. I can't remember where it was, huh? Lung, thank you. And um, anyway, he was uh, prepared. He had to go in for more tests. They were certain it was cancer. And I was chewing him out because he, it's almost like he forgot he plums at a church and there are intercessors at churches and they would end. So chewed him out, but put him on the prayer list. Well, anyway, he called Friday or Saturday to let me know that um, the, whatever it was is benign. He may still have to have surgery to have it removed. They're going to determine that. But it's not cancer. And he said, you know, he goes, I can't tell you how good I feel because they were certain it was cancer and I was going to get to deal with all that. And now I'm just happy as, you know, he, he feels uh, liberated, as you can well imagine. So he wanted to thank uh, intercessors around here, in particular those that were praying on his behalf. The other one is uh, Bob Hollister. For those of you who remember, he had a stroke. I think it's been almost two weeks now. Maybe it's only 10 days. But anyway, Bob had a stroke, and um, Cornelia reported that Friday he was able to actually start swallowing normally and chew normally, so now he's able to eat real food. So he's making some progress in his recovery, and he still covets our prayers, of course, but so does she, and wanted to let you know that they're having an impact, that, that uh, after a couple of weeks he's starting to make some progress on that. Um, and then another one, she didn't ask for prayers, but she's on there. Anne had a, a pacemaker. She had to have her old model exchanged for the newer, fancier models. I think it's got Wi-Fi and all kinds of other 
probably has car play so she can listen to music. You know how they are nowadays. So anyway, uh, she came through that uh, really well uh, earlier this week. And then for mine, I do appreciate the prayers. Everybody wanted to add, you know, what's going on. They don't know. Um, I have all kinds of infection in there, but I don't have the swelling. So they don't know. They took more samples, and they're going to try and figure it out. And I don't know that I'm inclined to go through that again. If they want blood and things, I'll give it to them. But um, as you can tell, I'm not somebody that likes to fast a lot. And, and I don't like to hang out in hospitals that much. You all are nice, those of you who are doctors and nurses. But I don't want to be at your place of, uh, of occupation too often. Um, anything else going on before we, before we get to birthdays and anniversaries? Just a reminder, in a couple weeks, now that you've gotten used to the litany of penitents, we're getting ready to, to switch gears again. So Palm Sunday, we'll be gathering over in the parish hall with mass and trying to social distance. And then we'll, be, you know, we'll do the litany of the palms over there and, and read the gospels and then come in here. Right now, the plan is either Abby will sing, and you can join in as you get to your pews, or we'll do the psalm. We'll figure that all out by the time we get there and let you know. But just understand there's some things that are going on we haven't done for a couple years because of the pandemic that we're going to be able to do this year. We're still going to be smart. Um, also understand it sounds like visitors are going to start being, you know, they're going to start returning at that point. So it's really important and we start getting our act together about do we sit on X's, do we not sit on X's, and all that kind of stuff. Because as people drift in, we want to be a little consistent and remind ourselves and them that the people that are among us may be at different paths on this vaccination attempt. To give you an example, your priest probably won't get vaccinated unless Rusty you know, finds an extra shot laying around for his long-lost brother until September, October. And I get exposed to all y'all, so you know um, there are a lot of us that are in different paths there. And I'm thankful for those who have gotten the vaccine, and so far nobody's grown those horns or grown tails or had arms fall off or anything bad. We've... we've uh, Everybody's really happy with the results so far. Um, but just keep in mind, we're not out of it yet, and so we need to remind ourselves of that when we begin to gather with the rest of the world. And I imagine this will be an important Easter for many people since last year's Easter services were not the traditional Easter service, and we've all gotten kind of tired of walking in the darkness. So, Any birthdays this week? Now, Miss Sarah, you didn't raise your hand last week for this week, and I, you had a birthday. Uh, make sure you wish Barbara a happy belated birthday. She didn't raise her hands, but... And if you don't know Barbara's big ministry around here, Barbara is the, the queen of the altar guild in terms of linen care and repair and all that kind of stuff. And uh, our vestments and everything would not look nearly as good if she didn't do her work. And then she's got great experience, so she can tell priests how to get the cords nice and clean and things, little tricks like that that I didn't know. So anyway, thank you for your service, Barbara, and happy belated birthday from the community. Anybody else having a birthday? Any anniversaries this week? None. All right. Then walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Holy Eucharist prayer continues on page 361 in your Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 What's in God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be this day, Holy Son. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Turning to page 365, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you this day and remain with you always. Amen. to love and serve the Lord.